in 2012 when I went down into Mexico and I preached down there. I told them this message. Do you think that God did all these things for me because I am so wonderful? Because I have been so good that I have been so kind or I am so holy? Do you think it's because I pray night and day or it's because I read my Bible all the time? Do you think that it's because I am anything that God would come and do all of these miracles for me and with me? Do you think that I am lifted up any higher than you are and that I am any better than you are? Not in the least. You would be very wrong if you thought any of these things. For you see, I am just like you. I am nobody. I am literally nothing in the sight of God. I am not pretending to be a scholar. I am not pretending to be anything. What I am is a woman who God took aside and taught me things in a relationship with him so that I can bring it to you and help you in your relationship so that you can grow, so that you can change for the better, so that you can be in your church and in your community and do the best as a woman of God, that you can be in your family, that you could be a better mother, that you could be a better teacher, a better everything. This is why these things happen to me. They didn't happen to me because I am any good. They happened to me because, and I always put my finger up to God and said, because you said you would do this for me. Because you said in your word that I had your promise that you would never leave me go. That you would always be there for me. Now, I want to tell you to have this attitude with God, this understanding with God, that he doesn't come because we're so special. He doesn't come because we're so good looking or bad looking or he feels sorry for us or he loves us or he sees us suffer. I have seen people suffer day in and day out for years and years and years and it seemed like God would never come. I have seen them not take up their cross, which was what God was waiting for, but I've seen them get up and gather together and get angry and fight, deciding that they were no longer going to wait for God to deliver them. They were going to take things into their own hands. They decided that they were going to be who they wanted to be all along, that they were going to covet everything someone else has and take it off of them, forgetting what the word of God says. And then they have people who support them, who baptize them, who Give them the word and, and assure them that they are on the right side. It is a good thing for them to do, to destroy other people. Innocent people. You know, How do I say innocent? Because through the generations, they had no part of what anybody in a past generation did. They have no part of nothing. But you punish them. You take them and you punish them for what you think you deserve. Now you tell me how God is going to bless that. You tell me where it's going to end. You tell me that when you come and you take and you covet and you do whatever you want and use his name to throw around, use him to say and preach and teach that you are the only true people in the world, that there is no other people in the world that is important as your parents as your heritage, as your family, as your neighbors, as your friends. No one counts but you. That's not God. If you can't see that that's not God, something is terribly wrong with you. When I wrote the book, Knowing the Terror of the Lord, I took it into black churches. And some of those women there marveled because I went through everything that they go through. And I'm not black. I went through persecution like you would not believe that they go through. And I'm white. At least I look white. I'm actually 
half Hispanic and half Polish. So, you know, but they looked at me and even asked me, well, do you, are you still married to the same man with all that you went through? And I said, yes, yes, I am. It's going to be 60 years and one soul is worth all the world. That one soul, God has been slowly working on for a long time. He's the one that could not do what other men could do. And other men come along and judged him, condemned him, hated him, put their nose up in the air. And you know, there was a period of time where I was so foolish that I went along with that, that I really believed that because I was hurting. And then God got a hold of me and told me the truth. God got a hold of me and showed me exactly where this man was. He showed me that he was where God wanted him. And oh, yes, every church around would persecute me and say, well, if your husband isn't with you, something is wrong with you. Well, that's judges. You're entitled to judge. We live in a free country. You're entitled to say whatever you want. You're entitled to believe what you want because it's a free country and we still have freedom of speech in spite of the fact that so many strove to take it away from us. Now ask yourself a question. If years ago the truth was preached and the heat and the fire of God was preached from behind the pulpit, they would have had them, and this is this is the way the preacher thinks, they would have had their parishioners flee. They wouldn't want to be in there. They had no idea that maybe God would want those that are willing to give money and don't even love God, have nothing to do with God. But oh, they praise the Lord all day long, and they, they do this, and they sing, and they do some of the most vile and evil things. But oh, they love God. They have no proof of it in their soul, in their heart, and in their mind. And who's going to tell them? Who's going to preach the truth to them? Have Has there any man ever been where they would really tell them? I'm not saying there's no man. I'm only trying to give you a picture of what has happened in the church, of what has happened where they have appeased those that are able to have money and give. They have respect for them. They get the finest seats in the church. They get the finest treatments. I've watched them even do it in the schools. I had one little boy come to me. He must have been about nine. And every day on the school bus, he would pass my house. And when he passed my house, I am telling you, he was a Christian, a true believing Christian. And from nine till about 12 years old, he was such a believing Christian. And he, his mother, uh, with a drug incident, one of the twin, his twin uh, babies died, his siblings, and she was in prison. When she got out, the other twin died from an, an incident with drugs. And this young man, he worked so hard in school. He had top grades in school. And you know what he told me? That the teachers took all of the bad kids out to ball games, all of the bad kids out and did everything with them. And no one ever paid attention to how hard he worked. No one cared that what he was doing was so important. He was changing his whole life. He was changing everything about where he came from. He was doing that on a daily basis. And every day, as faithful as clockwork, he would come and sit on my porch with me and read the Bible with me every day. It, he never failed. And so I know to this day, he is as faithful as he was then. And I know that he, when he disappeared out of my life, he went to a Christian college. And I only pray that he learned the truth, not what people tell him, that he remembers who God is not what people said he is. Because there's a lot of places because you attended this college or you attended, and this one has a name. This one, why he did this and he did that and she did this and she did that. Who are they? Did they die for you? 
that you should honor them so high that they're honored higher than God. And when I say higher, they are higher than God to you. It is because you will obey them if you see they are in error. When you can clearly see by the word of God that they're wrong, you won't get out of there. You won't go away from them. You stick there and thinking, well, you might be able to help them. Well, if the Holy Spirit that called them, the Holy Spirit that came down upon them and that comes every Sunday could not change their heart and their mind to do what is right in that Bible, who do you think you are that you can? Oh, I've seen too many try. Too many try. The hypocrite wants what the hypocrite wants. They're going to do what they want. And the Bible teaches actually that it's almost impossible for them to get saved. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for these people to ever get saved. Now, I'm not judging and condemning all people, but I'm telling you, there is so much hypocrisy that runs rampant and they lift up their pastor. And if you dare tell the truth, you are marked by them that you are a Jezebel. You are a Jezebel. If you show any signs that you might know the truth, you are a Jezebel. Well, you know what? A Jezebel was not a Jezebel necessarily because she painted her eyes. She painted her eyes because she was a Jezebel. She didn't paint her eyes and be called a Jezebel. She was a Jezebel because she had that evil spirit. Take it. It's yours. When Ahab was down and, and could not bear the thought that his neighbor would not sell him his vineyard, she walked in and said, what are you so sad for? You're king. Kill him and take it. Do you know how many on this earth to this day are following that Jezebel spirit? And they're claiming they're the only true people there is. Kill them and take it. You have the power. God will give you the power. Go go and tell them they must give everything to you. Bow your knee. Bow your knee and admit that you did this and you did that. <laughs> I was as persecuted as those people were. And you will never tell me persecution, hatred, all the things that you can suffer, all the dangerous situations I have been in my life did not turn me to covet what you have, did not turn me to hate you. So, you know, I'm going to be there on Judgment Day. I'm going to be there to look at you. And God is going to have me there so that you can see I overcame it in Christ. Not because I'm any good. I'm nothing. Not because I'm great. I am nothing before God and he knows it. He knows that if I would have had my way, I'd have never served him. I'd have never even wrote my books. I begged him every step of the way, fought and kicked every step of the way and said, no, 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 please, please don't call me to write this book. Nobody writes like this. Nobody does this. They'll crucify me. They'll, they'll destroy me. They'll, they'll hate me. I can't take it. Please, please don't do this to me. And the whole time that I was fighting God, he would come with that precious, real still voice and say, Marion, how could you doubt who I am? The tremendous power of his presence, his glory, was so fearful to my soul that I could not doubt him. I could not. If anybody would ever dare be into that and think it's not God. Something is wrong with their brain. Because I've been in the presence of demons out of hell. Multitudes of them. And never could they ever touch a hair on my head. And you say, well, you had this illness, you had that. Well, this is entirely different. My body failed me. That's entirely different. Not everything is caused by a demon. You give the devil too much credit. You know, I, I have people that will talk to me, and I, even a pastor, he said, he was so excited because he said, God brought a real prophet into his life, and the devil is mad. That's why he's having trouble. And I stopped him right there, and I said this to him. The devil has no part here. 
He doesn't live here. He has nothing that he could touch. So how he, the devil thinks and feel, feels means nothing to me. Nothing. I don't give him a second thought. As a matter of fact, I don't even give him the first thought. I don't care how he thinks and feels about what I'm doing. I don't care what he will use other people to do. I don't. I don't care about none of it. For God promised me that he would take care of me. How God does it is between me and God. I, I can't do anything to control my life. If God wants me in poverty, I'm in poverty. If he wants me with money, I'll have money. If he wants me to have a ministry, I have a ministry. If he wants me to preach, I will preach. Ooh, whatever God wants will come. It's not because a man, if a person comes and gives something to me and puts it in my hand, if you think for one minute that obligates me to preach what they want, you would be wrong because nobody buys the Holy Spirit in me. And if you think that I would take my book and sell it to a, a publishing company that wants to take it and do what they want to, you'd be wrong. I won't sell the word of God. Yes, I will. I, I have to have enough money to publish it, enough money to, to do all the things I do, and even to get help that can come and help me if, I, if God wants me on a podcast or if he wants me to do a certain thing. I'm almost blind, and it's very, very difficult for me to do anything. You wouldn't realize the stress and strain of each and every day of striving to do what I need to do as far as even the videos go. And how I have to magnify it to 300. And even then I struggle. And if I hold up a magnifying glass, I can't see through it. I can't see what I'm supposed to see. So it's not easy. It's a struggle every single step. Do you think I would be so ignorant to a God that has delivered me out of hell, out of everything, that I would get angry with him because my eyesight is still here? When I was younger, I did those ignorant, stupid things, but not now. No, I'm not angry with him. But I will tell you, my relationship with him is one where I can tell him exactly what I think and feel. And what I think is this, Lord, you promised me. You told me that if I write the book, you would do the rest. You told me you understood how hard and difficult it was for me to write a book who never wrote anything before, who never understood English, who was never a scholar. You told me that if I would follow you and do that, you would never fail me. So I'm guaranteed God's going to do something. It isn't for the money. It isn't for you're uh, somebody liking me. You know, if I have my way, I don't want to hear your comments. I don't want to hear anybody say, well, you're so great. You're so, great. you know, I have seen pastors, women pastors go downhill. So every day they were told the same thing. No one sings as beautiful as you do. She couldn't sing a lick. No one is as beautiful as you are. No one was all day long. They fed her that garbage and all day long. She believed it until she wound up hating people that dared to defy her, dared to think that she wasn't what she was told. I've got women that come to me even now. Everybody tells them why well, you're so beautiful. And some of these women are not beautiful, even in the least. But, oh, you're so beautiful. And they tell them that all the time. And guess what? They believe them. They believe them to a point that they go out there and show everything they own. Because they believe them. But they're holy. They are with God all day long. They wear the tightest of pants. They wear the tightest of everything. So you can see all their exercised work. And they will come and they will sit before me knowing that I've been sick for years where I couldn't even move. How could I do that? And at my age, it's near impossible. But I'll tell you what. I am as healthy as a horse. I am. I don't take any medication. I am very healthy. And <laughs> I was just tickled pink because God gives me the grace 
God gives me the, oh, hallelujah. He gives me the grace. When you make up your mind, you're going to follow him and you're going to do what he wants. You take that first step, even if it's a baby one. And wow, don't ever, ever back up. If you believe God spoke to you and it's good and it's holy and it's righteous and it's true and God spoke it to you of what you were to do, how you were to think, oh, don't ever back up. But if you find any flaw in it, anything that's wrong or any conviction that you are doing wrong, my advice to you is back up and shut up. Everybody used to work in this one church. And all you would hear is the women talking about the other women. Well, they aren't doing this and they're not doing their job and they haven't done this. The only thing I knew how to do with them is to tell them, shut up and do your own work. Leave them alone. Now, I wasn't defending those people because <laughs> most of them were wrong. But what I was trying to get the message across, if you're going to serve God, then serve him. Don't serve him with just your mouth and on a pretense of going out and witnessing. Don't you realize that if you don't live in your heart, Christ, if you don't love him so much that you would never hurt another person, never offend them on purpose. You know, many of you go out and you witness to people and you treat your own family like dirt. You talk to your children like they're garbage. You scream at them and you yell at them and you let them know in no uncertain terms that they are not going to get away with embarrassing you. They are not going to get away with never realizing these little children love Jesus. And he said it is better for a millstone to be tied around the neck rather than one of these little ones be hurt. So there you are in your home. You're a pastor. You raise a child. And when you raise them and you aren't in the place you should be, you start to pick on them. Oh, would I see it in school? I would go to school and, uh, and teach. And in my kindergarten class, a little boy, I'll never forget him as long as I live. He would raise his hand if he wanted to do anything. He was so mistreated at home. And he would raise his hand. He would have died before he would hurt his teacher or offend her or do one thing wrong. By the time he went into the next class, you could hear the teacher down the hall picking on him. Every tiny little thing he did, he did it wrong. Why? He was breathing and she didn't like it. He was literally breathing and she did not like it. No wonder another little boy wound up stabbing her with a pencil because she picked and picked and picked. And the ignorant superintendent of the school kept, oh, this is a teacher. She's a great teacher. She's a good, oh, you know, I don't know what kind of money she gave. I don't know what she did. I don't care. I'm only trying to give you an example that what goes on behind the scenes. You go into a church and you have no idea of what is going on behind the scenes. You only see what they want you to see unless you know God. And if you know God, you're either going to have to decide to shut up, back up, and get out of there. And keep your mouth shut about what's going on. Don't name names. Don't gossip about them. Don't talk about them. You know why? Because when you do, you're picking up their spirit. You're picking up the same things. I'm not telling you about people in the sense of gossip. I'm giving you testimonies to let you see what not to do, to protect you. All of these messages are to protect you. As Paul the Apostle would say, for you, it is safe. I want you to be safe, not me, Marion Lynch, God, he wants you to be safe. He raised you a certain way. He called you a certain way. Look at your fingerprints. They're different than anybody else's. And you know what that does? That makes you special. And when you are dealing with kids and you don't realize that every one of them before God is so special, you're going to have trouble with God. I had one woman, one parent tell me 
that she heard so many things about me as to why the children loved me, why they followed me, why they would listen to me. And they wouldn't listen to others who picked on them. And those others were real jealous too. And she came up to me and she said, I found out why. I watched you work with those children. And you treated every one of them like they were so special. And I looked at her and I smiled. I said, they are. Look at their fingerprints. Every one of you are special. Look at your fingerprints. Look at what God created. Honor it. Honor it and don't take it where it doesn't belong. Don't let it think up here what it where it doesn't belong. Don't let it go in here where it doesn't belong. Keep yourself safe in him. Love that relationship you have with him. Don't let a man come up to you and tell you through the scriptures that you can't have a relationship without your husband, that he is your head and he is your covering. I am telling you, if he's doing certain things wrong, that covering is a covering of darkness. If that church is teaching a wrong doctrine, doctrine, that covering is a covering of darkness. You have to have a covering. You have to have. Jesus never taught me that. Jesus taught me that Jesus and me can do anything. We can come overcome anybody. We can overcome any devil there is. Any murderer, any liar, any cheat, any one of them. And God in my life, as long as I have lived, has done just that. Just that in so many miracles in so many ways where I did not have to cry. I did not have to beg. He was always there. Why? Because he promised. And that promise isn't to me. When you're told that if you follow me, that you will be blessed, that God will give you everything because you're following me. I never taught that. There are lies right now where my book is concerned that are saying I said that. These liars said they came to my home and I said that. I never told them that because they never came to my home. I have a witness in my home. That is slander. It is one thing to give a bad review. It's another thing to slander someone and tell lies. And that sat there for 10 years and I let it go because I'll tell you why. I don't have to fight it and I don't have to handle it. It's all in the sight of God. And it's an organization that claims to have Christ. And when you can claim that and you destroy other people's lives through your gossip and your lies, when people come to you without, and, and pastors do this all the time, without that other person that's being accused being there to defend themselves. Without that, you know why? You know why they don't, don't want that person to defend themselves? Because usually that person is right. Usually that person has more than any one of them. They don't want to see that. They want to see you out of the church so they don't ever, ever have to do what they're supposed to do. They can continue to play, continue to do what they're doing. I think one of the worst is when people call themselves apostles and they receive a pastor lying about a person, whether it's a man or a woman, and they receive that without any proof, without anybody, just they have this witness said it because they gossiped. That was because they all got together and gossiped. How is that God? Why? Because you have all of these that witnessed against somebody who is innocent. Did you ever do what the Bible says and go to your brother and talk to him? Did you ever go and try and work it out with them? Or did you first run in your prayer meetings to a, a, a gossiping woman? Oh, well, she did this and she did that. And I'm just so hurt. Uh, all the while you're cheating on your own husband, playing games with men. And yet you are the hurt victim. And then him, I'm telling you, worse than ever before. Because every single thing since he got in contact with these people, he just, his spirit just went downhill, downhill, downhill. And then if you looked him straight in the eye and say, hey, did you talk to that pastor about me? And he went, oh, no, 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 no. Would, oh, he would never do that. Never do that. And then in the end, that pastor would say to me, you 
owe him something. This will never be right with you. I've got news for you. I've got peace over this. But people need to hear the truth. They need to know that these things are going on. They need to understand to stay away from it. I'm not telling you to go against the church. That would be wrong. I'm not telling you to go against a pastor. That would be wrong. I am telling you to do exactly what the Bible says. Do not do as they do. Do what they say, but don't do as they do. Because those are hypocrites. Those are people who really believe that God is with them because of who they are, what they can do, what they have done. God isn't with people for those reasons. All you have to have is the love of God so much in your heart that you would never do one thing to hurt any person on purpose. And if you wound up hurting a person, you go and you make it right. Which I strove to do. But they wouldn't hear me. They heard the liars. And it was all set up. So God told me, I owe them nothing. If it's all set up in gossip, I owe them nothing. I can face any person. I can look you straight in the eye here and I can say you have lied on me and know that it's true. Now, am I using my platform to, to, uh, to help myself? No. I'm exposing the truth the way God told me to. He said what he whispers in your ear. Shout it upon the housetops. Just this morning, he let me know. I gave you a message. And that message has to be given. And if you don't give it, you will answer to me. Because I raised you to give them. So don't be concerned about what they think and feel. Don't be concerned about where they can go and what they can do. Because nobody... Nobody is greater than I am in your life. Jesus is Lord of my life. I say this in the name of Jesus with all my heart. No matter where you go, no matter what you do against me, Jesus is Lord of my life. And this is what he needs to be for every one of you. So grow in grace. Grow in the fruits of the Spirit. Fruits grow. If they were not fruits, he would never, if they didn't grow, he would never call them fruits. Grow in the good things. You know, you can measure out what is important to God and what isn't. You could say to yourself, and he even tells you to, to don't pay attention to the lesser things. If you have a real big situation here, then pay attention to the big situation. This is how you weigh it. You weigh which one would God want. Would God care that you ripped babies' limbs and used their blood and used everything else, used them to destroy these babies that never even had a chance to be born, and now they are in some places want to kill them after they're born so that they can use them? Or do you think God is going to be with the one who loves to do this, who believes it's the right of a woman to murder? That's murder. And when you vote according to murder, you're going to pay for it and answer for it. Because God goes into that booth. And the Bible says that Jesus is coming. Is he coming for you today? Is he coming for you to straighten you up? Are you tempting him by supporting things that you know are wrong? You take a look at some of the women who claim to be of God, who dare to say there's a there's a there's a place, special place in hell for these women who will not support women to mur murder their babies that very same woman she'd sit there with all her breasts showing and her skirts way up and she was just lined up with all the men now you got one that's giddy around all these men <laughs> laughing all the time because she can't she can't hold herself these women that, that have porn, what they call soft porn. You'll see one that is on one of the news media and she's in a skirt and she's on a desk and she lifts her leg way up high in the air. What do you think she's saying? 
When you lift your leg up like that with a skirt, what are you saying? You want them to imagine what's under that? Is that what you're doing? And then you have the gall to say a godly Christian woman, it talks like a person or acts like a person with porn, quit acting it. Adulterers calling, uh, adulterers and adulteresses calling people that. They're doing it. They've done it. But they're pointing it out. They rant and they rave with hatred. And you listen to it. You, you sit before it and listen to it. And it's propaganda. And you think it's harmless. You think it's not hurting you. It permeates your soul. It's designed to do so. All the dirty, filthy jokes and all the dirty, filthy things that you watch. It's all penetrating your soul and teaching you how to deny God. That's another story.